you know, where we come from, where we got our name Hugo's, and uh, work it up to the present. Uh, we got our name Hugo's from my grandfather. Uh, he was born in 1900. And he operated what they called a, uh, a blind pig, where the pizza bottles are located today. Uh, a blind pig was, uh, during Prohibition, they uh, sold candy in the front, and they, uh, they sold uh, liquor, illegal liquor in the back. <laughs> and uh, Ashland was a, a big shipping town at that time, and so business was good. <laughs> he, uh, he was arrested for a while and uh, put in a local jail, I think they told me, for something like 90 days, 60 to 90 days. And uh, because the local law enforcement were his best customers, they, uh, they allowed him to go to jail during the day and then he went home at night to run his business. <laughs> They did that until the end of Prohibition, and then they turned their, uh, you know, illegal operation into a legitimate tavern operation. Uh, and uh, my father was born in 1926, and he started sailing when he he served in the military and during World War II, and then he, he sailed for a few years and got his seed money. And he built in the mid 50s, early to mid 50s, he built a restaurant they called Frankie's uh, across from where the pizza pub is today. And uh, he turned it into Ashland's first pizza place, called it Frankie's Pizza. Uh, it started out as a malt shop uh, the first year he was there, and then he built it into a, he decided pizza was what he wanted, and he built it into that. And it, it, it was a good business. He had a, a young woman working for him in the early 60s by the name of uh, Mickey Iverson. And in uh, 1963, he sold the business to her and her husband, Charles. They passed away a few years ago, but their children and grandchildren uh, continue to run the business, and they've been very successful. Uh, we moved to Arizona when they sold, when they sold the business. And uh, for about three, three years, and things didn't work, work out over there. So we, uh, we moved back to Ashland, and uh, my grandparents, Hugo and Josie, they were, you know, in their mid to late 60s by, the time, by that time. So uh, we took over the tavern, their tavern, Hugo's tavern at that time and started putting in food right away, and within a year we started selling pizza. So we had two pizza places, right, you know, uh, Frankie's was across the street, and then we were at Hugo's, uh, direct, well, almost directly across the street. The only thing left of the original building of uh, Hugo's now, uh, since uh, we sold it in 1972, uh, is uh, to Ed Thayer, is uh, the, the brick on the front of the building. They remodeled it extensively and, and really built it up into a, you know, quite a good business. Uh, in 1967, my father and Red Flinchek, his friend and business partner, they started a frozen pizza company in an old grocery store on 14th Avenue East. It was uh, Cotty's Grocery. At that time, you didn't have to have much to get into the frozen pizza business because nobody really made it. You know, and us and Tombstone were the only ones around at that time. And uh, so we had, a, there wasn't a lot of competition. Um, you know, it was a lot of work. You made the frozen pizzas by hand. Uh, and the hardest part was uh, uh, delivering them and getting them to where they had to go. Uh, and getting into, like, stores. And we had a lot of bars where we, I think at one time we had uh, uh, 60 pizza ovens in different bars and resorts around the area that, that we sold to. Uh, in 1967, uh, about a couple years later, uh, uh, his business partner, Red, uh, decided he wanted to open up his own place, so he, he moved to uh, Winter, South Dakota, 
and opened up his own restaurant called Pizza Tom's. And uh, they, uh, they, so they sold the business uh, at first to, uh, uh, I apologize, I don't remember the, his first name, he was a, his name was Pearson, he was from Washburn, and uh, they changed the name of the frozen pizza business to uh, Stefano's. And uh, they, uh, sadly, him and his daughter's uh, fiance were, were killed on the, pizza, on the frozen pizza route. If I, if I remember right, it was up near Birch Hill one winter. And so there, that, that didn't end it, didn't quite end it at that time. They sold it to uh, uh, Alec Hallman from Washburn. And uh, he was a, uh, a cook on the Great Lakes. And he went down to Fitzgerald a few years later. So that's pretty, pretty bad luck there. Uh, in 1972, uh, my father wanted to give Arizona another try, so he sold the, uh, he sold Hugo's to uh, Ed Thayer, and uh, Ed, Ed changed the name of the Pizza Pub, and you know he uh, remodeled quite a bit and put in his uh, he started selling uh, salad dressing to grocery stores and things like that. You know he's done quite well, as has his son Sean. You know since he's taken it over. Uh, Things didn't work out good in Arizona. It worked out okay in Arizona, but he, it was boring. And my father got tired of it right away, so he wanted to come back to Ashland. So since we already had two restaurants, we decided, well, if we're not going to go into the restaurant business again, we're going to only go into the frozen pizza business. And so we bought a, uh, bought a piece of property across from the bowling alley on Sanborn Avenue and uh, built, a, uh, built a plant there. And uh, by then it was getting, you couldn't just go in any place and, and uh, open up a, you know, any type of frozen food factory. You had to, there was a lot of rules and we went across state lines so we had to be uh, a federally inspected meat plant. And uh, so there was a lot of, you know, it, it, it cost a lot of money to, you know, to, Put the plant in, and it had you know it had to have uh, uh, cement floors that you could hose the whole place down at the end of every shift with sanitizing you know, the whole the walls. Everything had to be, had to be cleaned every every day. Um, we had to, we had to have an inspector that would uh, come down from Superior every day. But we couldn't operate unless he could be there on that day. And uh, he's a pretty good guy. I, I liked him a lot in that, but. He, uh, he would have to, he'd always have to fill out a, a report every day, and if he didn't have something on that report, it looked like he wasn't doing his job. And, you know, he'd run out of things to put on his report. I remember one, one day I had a sign in it down at the top and said, uh, violation, and it said, uh, one fly in the processing area. <laughs> and then on the bottom of the report it said, uh, action taken, and it said, killed immediately. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's important to have those guys because you, know, you know as much as people don't like being told what to do you know it's a, you got to have food, food safety because it's you know bad things can happen without it uh, in a few years after we had a pretty good business going to also we uh, we ran two two trucks and we covered an area from, uh, from Ashland to uh, Ontonagon, Michigan. Uh, we went down to like Rhinelander and, uh, and um, Prentice. And then we also kept a second truck in Superior and uh, did the Iron Range in Minnesota. We had a, a contract with uh, 14 7 11 stores uh, where we did joint advertising with them. And in return, they gave us four facings in each one of their stores and so that that was a you know a big boom for us because you know it, 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 it gave us something to get to while selling pizzas on the way there so we always had a lot of stops in between and stuff like that and that went on pretty well until about the mid 80s and then there was like a pizza explosion um, 
every grocery store had a whole section of, you know, devoted to frozen pizzas. Uh, bought a competition, the store owners wanted lower price, you know, there was the only, they didn't move fast enough unless you were selling on sale, so they, you know, wanted more sales and more sales. And uh, we made our pizzas by hand, so that the, the profits started to shrink. And uh, also at the same time, we had all these businesses or these taverns and resorts in the area. I mean, we would spend a whole day just going around uh, Lake Old and New Cog and on our way down to Hayward, you know, servicing all these places. Well, they started to slow down right at that time too, you know, because of uh, OWI laws and some of them just couldn't make enough money to, you know, keep going. So a lot of them closed. And the ones that did close put in food also, and they, you know, some made their own lot made their own pizzas and things like that. So we lost, you know, a lot of business there. So by the uh, late '80s, you know, I pr I pretty much had enough, you know, and uh, we uh, we decided just to go exclusively into the restaurant business and. We'd all, we, we built our restaurant that we have now in 1980, but our two buildings were not connected. Uh, one was the pizza plant, the other was the restaurant. So we, we uh, connected the two and uh, just went into the restaurant business. Even though we still sell frozen pizzas today, uh, you know, we keep them in our freezer for our regular customers who come in and get them and stuff like that. And we actually sell quite a few of them. Uh, One of the biggest hurdles in the business that we have is not having a location on the highway, uh, especially in a tourist area like this. So we got to do everything we can to bring the customers to us. Uh, we have a billboard on the highway for quite a while. We use Facebook and, and our website. My daughter-in-law takes care of that for me. Uh, we do. Uh, a couple of major fundraisers. We've been doing one with our Lady of Lake uh, Church uh, since the early 90s, and that's been very successful. We do that every year. And then we sit for the last uh, six or seven years, we also do another one with the Ashton School of Dance. And we do them at times of the year when we're probably going to be a little bit quieter. Right now, we're doing one with the Ashland School of Dance. and. Uh, in February, we'll be doing one again with uh, Our Lady of the Lake. And they, they work out well for us. We, we give up a pretty good percentage of our profit. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we give them 25% of the selling price. So if they're selling like a 16-inch pizza for six bucks, they're making $4 off that, which is a you know pretty good percentage of our profit. But it works out well for us because it brings us customers that we normally wouldn't get and it also keeps our crew busy you know if I got a, if I have an employee that's standing around doesn't have a pizza to make I'm losing money anyways so this is you know absolutely that works out well for us um, and we do we do uh, benefits fairly often we, we do one for the CHA and the brick uh, and in our advertising like I said before we do the you know, Facebook and our website, but we all we also uh, we do our hotel directories, keep menus in the hotels as best we can. You know, and that helps. Uh, and our advertising is the uh, you know we, we I like to spread it around with as, as many people as I can, especially when they're mainly local people, businesses that I'm doing business with, the, the Daily Press, the Shopper, the Bottom Line, Radio. Uh, I advertise with the Chamber and also the, the Bay Theater. Uh, whatever, what's the most effective? I, it's impossible to say, but all, all of the above probably. Uh, I like to give back to the community by buying as many of our products from local distributors as I can. We buy about 60% of our, 60 and maybe higher of our foods from local distributors. Uh, I'll use Up North Foods, 
North Country Specialties, Lakeside Products, and uh, all our fresh meats we buy local from the 6th Street Market. Uh, what's the most challenging part of the restaurant business right now? Uh, maintaining employees and keeping, you know, keeping your best employees and, uh, and trying not to have too high of a turnover rate because it, it uh, to be consistent, you know, you like to have somebody that's been doing it for a while. Uh, you can have uh, 10 to 12 full-time employees and about 15 part-time. We've been lucky that our full-time employees, we've had a few that we've had for over 30 years. And so that, you know, that, that just is, well, I don't know what I'd do if we didn't, because it would be pretty tough. We, we'd be working a lot, we'd be there a lot less always, that's for sure. Uh, our part-time employees, you know, it's, it's almost like a revolving door sometimes. And you like to try to keep them as, as long as you can because everyone you have, you have an investment in. You have to train them. If it takes you a week or two to train them, you're paying them for that week or two before they're actually even, you know, able to do anything. So, you, you know, you're better off, you know, trying to, you know, retain them as best you can. On your full-time employees, you know, we can't pay, because the profit margins aren't there, we can't pay as, as good a wage as, as, you know, some other places, and the same with, uh, you know, benefits. It's, you know, even benefits for ourselves are, are pretty hard to come by. So, you know, so some of our employees that uh, I can't offer them health insurance because we wouldn't be able to afford it, so I, I give them extra money or extra check every month so that they can pur help purchase their own. And then some of our long-term employees, they have spouses that have jobs that where they, they carry the insurance, and that's why they, they've stayed with us for so long, otherwise they, they probably wouldn't have been able to. Uh, and dependability is the absolute the main thing you want also is uh, if somebody doesn't show up, you have to immediately, if it's a Friday night, you've got to immediately, you know, put somebody in their place. And if you don't have anybody, then it's, that's bad for business and things, you know, things don't work out. Uh, well, I've been too, well, lately we've been trying to cross-train as many employees as possible so that if on a Friday night when I have to have two waitresses and a counter person, if one of those waitresses gets sick, you know, if I have to, I can pull one of the pizza makers off of the, off of the pizza line and, uh, and send them out there, even though, you know, they may not be quite as experienced. It's, it's better than, you know, not having a good one at all. Uh, you know, when it's on a busy night, you know, it's, it takes about 12 people to, uh, to run the whole operation. And some, sometimes more, depending on what, you know, what time of year it is, you know, between deliveries and waitressing and cooks and, you know, it's, it's uh, quite extensive. Uh, I like to keep every customer that I have, if I possibly can. Uh, if you're my customer and you buy one 16-inch pizza a week for $20, that's over a thousand dollars a year, and I got a lot of customers that do that, and so you know I don't want to lose them. And at the same time, you always got to try to attract you know new customers um, as, as best you can. So you know I'm hoping that you know when we do our fundraisers and our uh, benefits and things like that, that we're always picking up new customers along, along with that. Uh, What's the keys to the success of our business? Well, it go, I think it goes back to the keeping one customer at a time. Uh, you're not always going to get everything right. You know, we might have on a, on, a, on a busy night, say a Friday night, we do a lot of stuff. We do fish fry, we do pizzas. Uh, you know, we might have hundred fish fries and 150 pizzas on a Friday night. Uh, 
not every not every transaction is going to go right. You know, you're going to make mistakes, and you just got to you know fix them as best you can. You know, we, you know, if that if that customer didn't have a good experience, or if you got the wrong order, or something like that, you know, we replace it with no questions asked. Uh, you know, sometimes you might have the customer from hell. <laughs> You know, out of that many people, you're going to get a few. It's just, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do, you can really do about that. It's just swallow your pride and give them whatever they want. But it's not, it's never, it's never worth arguing, you know, about, oh, did they make this mistake on this or that. It's better just to take care of it and fix it. Uh, um, for, uh, Financing, we haven't, you know, made any major purchases lately. It's, uh, you know, nowadays it's a lot tougher to get financing than it was 40 or 50 years ago if you even needed financing at that time. Uh, when we, uh, when, when my father left the business, we, uh, instead of going and borrowing money and, uh, and just paid buying him out. We went and saw a lawyer, and we had papers drawn up, and we paid him a certain amount for uh, X number of years. Actually, we, we, just, we were going to do it for his, the rest of his lifetime. We lived longer than we expected to. <laughs> Saved us quite a bit of money because you, can, you you can't do it without including. You're not legally allowed to do it without including interest in with it, but it can be a very low rate of interest. And I had I had a, uh, a sister that retired from the business about three years ago, and uh, we did this, the same thing with her. We refinanced a, a piece of property that we had to pay her a down payment, and then we paid her so much a month for. For ten years until uh, mm -hmm. until she uh, gets the full amount of what she she got uh, for the uh, for the future of our business. You know, it looks it's a lot of work. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, our fiscal year ended June thirtieth of this past year, and uh, we had our highest grossing year ever. So. I'm you know, I'm pretty happy about that, and it does. It has been going up every year. Uh, it, it never goes. It's never gone backwards yet. So I mean, I'm happy about that. Uh, I myself, my career is pretty much winding down. Uh, I still do a lot of. We do. We have a, a, a catering business. We do for business lunch catering. And I do, we do a lot of business with the hospital and. Uh, CISA 12 and uh, some of the clinics in that. And uh, I, I mainly take care of that and, and do some of the bookkeeping. But I'm, I'm kind of getting myself out of the business. My, uh, my son Tony and my younger brother, <coughs> they're going to pretty much be taking over for me. And uh, I just, hopefully they'll keep sending me my check. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, I just want to say thank you for it. Tim said he wanted to go first tonight. Uh, he's a little bit older than I am. He goes to bed a lot earlier. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Tim. Love to have you stick around. I'll try to stay away. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful family, the Ladine family, and they happen to be a customer of ours and good friend of ours. So I was really thrilled that I could be here tonight and uh, present alongside uh, Hugo's Pizza. Anyway, uh, just to, to clarify, I think Betsy mentioned that uh, they were going to have a, some kind of a drawing uh, later.
for some root beer to take home. Actually, all of you can take it home. There's some sample jugs out there, and they'll be filled with 1919 root beer. Uh, so you're all welcome to uh, take a jug home with you uh, until the keg runs out, I guess. <laughs> And I, I don't have a technical assistant. <laughs> I'm just going to wing it. My name is uh, John Dome, and uh, I represent the, the third generation uh, of a family beverage business. And uh, before I get started here, I, I want to acknowledge that the, I've got some family here tonight, and uh, some friends, and uh, I think I saw my sister Kathy was here, and she actually worked for our company for about 17 years as a bookkeeper, and she, she's now retired and enjoying grandchildren. So, uh, thanks for coming out, Kathy. We don't visit very often, so I think she just came here to visit with me. How was the kids? <laughs> <laughs> also, like to introduce uh, my wife, Julie, uh, who keeps everything together for us. Uh, she's right here in the front row, as well as my, my sons, Adam and Eric, and my daughter, Lindsay, is here. Uh, I have another daughter, Brianna, but she's on a business trip down to Milwaukee. Um, I brought a couple of props with me here tonight uh, on that table up there, and that's what uh, that's what the beer cases and kegs looked like back in about 1939. That uh, that case sitting on top of the keg there that that held about 35 pint bottles, so you can imagine how heavy that case was. I had a hard time just bringing it out of the attic empty. <laughs> uh, so when my dad was young, he uh, his job was to water down those empty kegs, those wooden kegs, because you had to keep them swelled up to send back to the brewery. There's, there's no doubt about it that our family business would have never been successful without dedicated employees and certainly some loyal customers for about 78 years now. And uh, some of them might be here tonight, so I want to thank you first and foremost. That, uh, did you recognize the, uh, the picture on the right there? You notice the background, the ore dock that we don't have anymore? Now that, that picture was taken uh, back in the early 50s, I believe. That was my grandfather's first new truck and that was hex bar in the background there but there's my grandpa's first truck and that was a, a flatbed and the only reason I knew it cost $150 used is because it said it on the back of the picture <laughs> but in the background there You'll notice a, a warehouse being built, and inside that warehouse was his first warehouse, which actually was just a wooden railroad car, a box car, and that's how he started. And then he eventually just built on around that railroad car, and then he built on again, and then eventually they raised the entire building up so they could use a forklift inside to raise pallets up and stack pallets too high. Um, that building still exists on the east side of Ashland, and inside that building are still the two ends of the wooden railroad car. So it's fun to look at. Uh, I think that's Dale Kupchak on the top of that beer, one of the kids. No, I'm just kidding, Dale. <laughs> I actually don't know who that is. <laughs> but um, my grandfather used to uh, pick up beer from Duluth. That was his first beer, was the, uh, 
the Royal Bohemian brand, and it was made at the Duluth Malting and Brewing Company. And uh, he would go up there and pick up the beer himself, and also he would haul back produce to help pay for the trip. And uh, that produce went to the Hunt's Family Food Center. And I think I saw March here earlier. Yeah, so that would have been uh, George's dad that my grandfather hauled some produce back for him. On the right there, uh, there's Walter Dome, and um, that's the first selfie ever taken in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> when we first uh, saw that picture, I think my son said, boy, he was kind of having a bad hair day. <laughs> he says, actually, I think he was having a good day until my grandmother found out that he was drinking beer in the afternoon, and then it turned into a bad day. <laughs> so that's a picture of my grandfather and my dad there with their Royal Bohemian truck. That was their first enclosed truck. And uh, my dad was about 22 years old in that picture. The Royal Bohemian brand was called Royal 57 until another company came out with a product called Heinz 57. And then that company changed the name of the beer to Royal 58 because people were starting to call it the ketchup beer. <laughs> and they didn't want that association, so uh, the, the 58 actually stood for 5.8% alcohol by volume. So when they changed the beer from 5.7 to 5.8, it was kind of an undertaking because it, it, it changed the product. Then later on, my dad, uh, my grandfather, uh, procured the uh, Fox Deluxe brand out of Chicago. And uh, he didn't go to Chicago to pick it up that I know of. But uh, we think my grandfather started in business in 1939, but I did ask my dad, what did he do before 1939? Because it's really not in the city directory. My dad said, well, the way your grandpa put it, prohibition, the only thing worse than prohibition would be having no beer at all. So I'm assuming that he probably was in the beer business just like Tim's uh, grandfather was in the liquor business. <laughs> he did not go to jail. <laughs> The, uh, the picture on the right there, one year after the picture on the left, and the only reason I know that because it was written on the picture, but my dad did tell me a story about him and my grandfather delivering to a, a tavern just east of Ashland, and uh, they delivered together. Now this particular tavern had a big dog, a big German shepherd, and it never barked but it did bite. <laughs> and so when they went to deliver, they would always check the front door. It was a swinging screen door, but it had plywood over the screen because people always pushed it out. So when they got to the tavern, they'd always open the door a little bit, and it squeaked. And if they heard the toenails coming down the steps, they knew the dog was coming. So then they would hold the door until the owner took the dog out back and tied him up. Well, one day my dad and my grandfather were making a delivery at that tavern, and my grandfather didn't hear the dog, so he went in with the cartload of beer. And uh, my dad followed with another cartload, and my dad could hear that dog's toenails coming down the steps. So my dad quickly went out of the door and held the door like this. <laughs> And that door is like that. And here's my grandpa on the other side trying to get out. That dog's got him by the ankle. So I think that 
that's the reason there's a second truck. My grandfather probably said, no, you're, you're delivering with your own truck. <laughs> jump ahead uh, quite a ways here because we've got 78 years to cover in about 20 minutes so I'm going to move ahead to when my father uh, purchased the business from my grandfather in about 1968 and then uh, incorporated in 69 and actually moved the warehouse to a new location in the west end of Ashland and uh, where those trucks are parked uh, there's actually a third building there now today. Um, but he was lucky to get the Paps Blue Ribbon brand because the, the Royal Bohemian and the Duluth Malting Company went out of business and so did Fox Deluxe. So he was very fortunate to have another brand to rely on. About uh, 1975 uh, is when I started working uh, for the company. I graduated from high school. My intention at first was not to go into the beer business. Uh, I actually wanted to go off and uh, go to uh, architectural design school. Uh, I kind of liked doing that in high school, the design classes. And uh, my dad broke his leg and he needed some help. And uh, well, here I'm standing before you today, uh, about 40 some years later. Uh, so that's kind of how it goes sometimes. Ironically, my daughter Brianna is a architectural designer. <laughs> Go figure. So, in, uh, as you can see in that picture on the left there, uh, at that point in time there was really only kegs, cans, and bottles. Unlike today when there's so many different packages of beer and soft drinks, it's just overwhelming. So my wife and I purchased the company from uh, my parents in 87 and uh, a couple years later we actually celebrated our 50th anniversary in the business. And we did that by uh, bringing the, uh, the Paps Brewing Company wagon up here uh, along with the big Percheron horse team and uh, we visited every single place in Ashland with a brass band on the wagon playing the beer barrel polka. <laughs> Uh, and we also brought them over to the Apple Fest. It was that time of year, and they were in the Apple Festival parade. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun. The business uh, was uh, was going pretty well, uh, but we were able to uh, acquire the Line and Kugel uh, brands from Chippewa Falls. And it was kind of an unknown product up here at the time. Um, but we sure had fun working with uh, Bill Wine and Google. Uh, he would come up here himself. Uh, and uh, what a nice family. Uh, we also acquired the, uh, the Huber brands out of Monroe, Wisconsin. Um, they make uh, brands like the Rhinelander beer and um, uh, a lot of different craft style beers. In uh, 1999, uh, we purchased uh, Renario Beverages here in Ashland. And uh, that, was, that was a big step for us. We added a lot of uh, brands and packages. Um, and then uh, two years later, I purchased the Pritzel Beverage Company down in, in Park Falls. So kind of gave us a lot more geography to cover as well. 
it was overwhelming at first, but uh, you know, you gotta just work hard and uh, iron out the wrinkles. Uh, we also added uh, some specialty soft drinks, such as the 1919 Red Beer that you may have tasted earlier. And uh, we also started a bottled water division. Uh, my dad didn't understand that. Uh, <laughs> bottled water. You realize, of course, he says, you know, there's a lake about four blocks from here. <laughs> it's perfectly good water. People like it. He says, I know, but... I'm hearing people ask for bottled water in the grocery store. They're asking for it. And uh, so we, we got into that. That picture up there, I, I just put it up there for the sake of, as, as you can see, the, the size of the vehicles have changed considerably through the years. Uh, and that's because of all the different packages. Um, as well as we can load those kind of trucks on the left there with a forklift. You put the, pick the pallet right up and those doors roll up and the pallet goes right in there. So that, uh, that third warehouse that we built come in pretty handy uh, with all these different brands that we, we took on. Uh, we had beer from Ireland, uh, the Guinness brand, and, uh, and the Old Style, and, and uh, several others. So the, the warehouse was starting to get a little crowded, so I'm, I'm glad we had a third building there to uh, put those products in. As you can see, everything comes by the pallet. And the, uh, the bottle of water, we not only have the package water that you see on the bottom of the screen there, but uh, we have the five gallon that goes on those, those coolers that you see uh, on the front of the truck, and we, we rent those or sell those to mostly businesses. Uh, I would have to say most of our customers are our business customers for the bottled water. Uh, we cover quite an area. Uh, northern Wisconsin, probably well, we go down as far as Phillips, Wisconsin, and maybe uh, Manitowish Waters in, in Iron County. And of course we go north uh, Cornucopia, Herb Street, Port Wayne, Iron River. Uh, so I would say about a 75 mile radius is what we, we cover in our business. And I'm sure you've probably seen some of those brands out in the grocery store and if the display looks really nice, we put it there. <laughs> so there's that, that third building I was telling you about, how oh, desperately we needed that. Um, when it comes to uh, soft drinks, uh, you've probably noticed out there that soft drinks have not just one flavor, but they got to have like six or eight flavors of the same product. That seems to be the way it is. You'll see that on the right there. There's a, many different colors to, uh, I think that's a, a lemonade product there. But um, we carry the 7-Up brand and there's everything under the rainbow there too, A and W and some kissed orange and oh boy. And then of course there's got to be a diet for every flavor too. So. Uh, those are some of the uh, some of the labels that uh, we distribute and you've probably seen them out in the store somewhere. Um, we kind of gravitate towards the, the real real type products. Real sugar. And uh, Maybe it's not good for you, but it tastes good, and people like what tastes good. Um, some of these uh, brands that we carry, they've been around a long time. Um, the, the Fago Company, I think, was started in like 1907 out of Detroit. It's still there, and uh, it's very popular. So with all the different uh, sodas and, and stuff, there's, we have about 72 different packages uh, in our warehouse, just with the soft drinks. And the trucks even get bigger and longer. But the technology has improved in equipment too. You know, even though we're a beverage distributor, we're actually, a, we're in the transportation business, there's no doubt about it. Because we, Paul product from the, the
the manufacturer's location to our location, and then we put it on our road trucks and bring it to retailer locations. So a lot of transportation involved. That particular truck there, under the driver's door, you see a, a blue tank under that step. And even though you see a chrome stack there where the exhaust would come out, this particular piece of equipment actually reburns 90 some percent of the exhaust. It reburns it so there's almost no emissions into the air. That's incredible. What isn't incredible and just boggles my mind is why can't these people that design this stuff build an engine that can get better mileage? It doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that's incredible technology. You get inside the cab of that truck and start it up, it, 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 it's like you're in the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> There's lights going off and beeps and buzzers, and it's setting up that emissions program. Although this equipment is new, uh, you can see the little uh, inset picture on the right, we were able to take a little piece of history and put it on the back of our truck. And uh, that was that first uh, picture of that truck that you saw. That picture actually was only two inches by two inches. It was a black and white photograph. And I sent it downstate to a company, Wisconsin Screen Print, to see if that could be blown up the size of that truck without losing resolution. And he called me, he says, didn't lose any resolution. So I thought it'd be nice to put that on our truck. So, pretty soon the, the craft beer craze started to happen. I know you're all familiar with it. A lot of little startup companies all over the place uh, wanting to brew beer and bring it to the market. And uh, some of these people came to us and asked if we would be interested in uh, distributing their products. Um, I gotta tell you, I can't say no to a salesman because I've been one my whole life. So we pretty much, uh, if somebody would like us to distribute their products, we certainly are going to give it our best effort. And those logos on the top are some of them that we carry today. Uh, Northwoods Brewery is, is down by Eau Claire. And uh, Bull Falls, that's uh, in Wausau. These are fun places to visit if you ever get to any of these communities. Uh, the Minas Craft Brewery down in Monroe. And of course, Sprecher just north of Milwaukee. I'm sure you're... If you haven't had their, their beer, you've probably tried their root beer. It's pretty popular. But uh, one thing about craft beer is that it gave people an option. At least it told them that beer is not necessarily just yellow. You know, beer is dark and it's red and it's a whole lot of things and they even put fruit in it. But I gotta tell you, if my grandfather knew that they were putting fruit in beer, he would flip over in his grave. <laughs> he really would. So anyway, I'd like to uh, talk to you a couple minutes about something that's happened in our family uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, that's my son Adam, who's sitting in the front row here. And uh, for about 10 years, he was a, a home brewer as a hobby. And uh, he monkeyed around that with that for quite a while. He wanted to produce a beer that was just like a regular beer, not real heavy and not real lightweight, not a crafty thing, but just something that everybody could enjoy. And um, I tasted some of his concoctions that he came up with, and oh. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it was painful for a while. <laughs> One day, he, he had worked pretty diligently at this, and he, uh, he brought me some samples. And I tasted it. My wife tasted it. I says, I gotta tell you, Adam, I think you, you've got something here. Well, lo and behold, the local South Shore Brewery in town was holding a home brewer's contest. 
and he invited anybody who was a home brewer to bring your recipe to the brewery for a contest. So Adam brought his, his beer to the contest and there was about 15 other craft brewers or home brewers there. So what they decided is the same 15 that showed up were going to be the judges. And lo and behold, Adam won the contest. And uh, the prize for winning the contest was to brew your recipe at the South Shore Brewery one time on a large scale. And that's a lot different than brewing it at home. That batch of beer that was brewed there uh, was a, maybe about 18 kegs worth. And then they sold it at the, the restaurants connected, the deep water. And those kegs, those 18 kegs went in about three and a half weeks. And they said, wow, that's, that's faster than we go through most anything here. So right away, Adam, the wheels were turning, you know, he's thinking, geez, maybe we should just, maybe I should just get some equipment and a building and, and you know, and I go, oh my gosh, Adam, baby steps. <laughs> something out and that's exactly what happened um, so the beer is brewed locally here at South Shore Brewery and uh, I gotta tell you these young men here Adam and Eric they put a lot of uh, time and effort into this uh, this dream of theirs and uh, hard work does pay off a um, couple of shots there of the, uh, the beer being brewed and uh, there's our, our kegs. We bought our own kegs. Um, we bought used kegs, by the way. Like I say, baby steps. <laughs> but hard work does make dreams come true. And I, I, I remember telling Adam that uh, I'm not going to give you a half a million dollars to set up a brewery. Because this is, this is your dream. It's not mine. And this is going to mean a lot more to you guys building this one keg at a time. So that's what they're doing. So it's one thing to brew beer. It's something totally different to bring it to the market. Because you're up against some pretty big companies with a lot of money. And uh, so what do you do for marketing? You get the best marketing guy that you can find. And that just so happened to be his brother, Eric. Because he's got lots of marketing know-how, and he's got a dynamic smile. And that's him up there uh, at beer tastings. Uh, that might have been at the big top, Chautauqua or something. But uh, I think at, at, uh, at this point in time, I would like to call on Eric. He may have a few words to say about the Dome Beer brand. speaking in front of crowds, a lot of guitar, so this will have to do for tonight. Um, we had these tap handles made locally here by Tyler Pierce at Voyager Paddles, and we realized that the paddle was already taken as a tap handle, so we needed something else, and we went with this. So if you've seen this out there, this was locally made in Ashland. 
Um, we've got some coasters as well. And the guitars that you see on there were actually guitars that were, one of them was mine, one of them was Adam's that we used to play and write music on. And we had Jason Ronning from Primetime Design put the graphics on there. And uh, Music Center, Ashland, refurbed them for us, put new strings on there, tuned them up for us. So if you see them downtown, feel free to pick them up, play them. That's what they're there for. We wanted something that was an interactive uh, product placement, you know. Uh, people can pick it up, play it, instead of just looking at it, you know. Tell us your story with our story kind of a thing. Um, we did have a couple of opportunities to market in other places online. If you've any of you do Facebook, check us out on Facebook as well. We are on there. We do have updates once in a while. And we did do a radio commercial with uh, Heartland Communications. And we brought it along here. I can find it. And this commercial, I did it myself at my house with some recording software. And uh, John Warren happened to be by the warehouse and asked if we had anything that we wanted to put on the, on the air. I said, actually, I do. We should try this out. So some of you may have heard this on there. This was Don Beer's very first radio ad. The Shawamigan Bay Area is a special place. A place that we're all happy to say that we're from. A place where we work hard to do our part. And a place where we know how to enjoy ourselves. Next time you're out celebrating with friends and family, ask for a Don Beer on tap at your favorite restaurant or local establishment. Brewed right here by your friends and neighbors delivered by your friends and neighbors, and served up fresh by your friends and neighbors. <laughs> wow, I guess we all really do know each other here. <laughs> That's the beauty of a small town, where everyone's voice adds to the harmony. Don't beer, Ashland, Wisconsin. Fresh. Local. Cheers.